herbal grassroots formulation for insect pest problems in agriculture and also he will be sharing his uh, uh, research exp uh, uh, research papers on spider protein formulation a human health leader that was developed at uh, sadgav shristi sanshodhan uh, national product laboratory uh, doctor you can start your okay Are you able to see my PPT? Uh, yes, doctor. Visible. It is visible. Ah, uh, yes, doctor. Visible. Okay. Okay. Hello, friends. The topic of today's discussion is herbal grassroots formulations for insect pest problems in agriculture. I think many of you would have been gone through the. Uh, uh, materials which have, has been earlier sent by Amar, there was few websites mentioned in them. Many of you would have gone through that. Am I correct? Many of you have you gone through it or not? Uh, uh, we have not had shared, Professor. Only after your lecture we will share. I am not talking about the PPT. The uh, for, regarding the schedules. Yes, lecture, lecture in in that. Yeah, uh, in that we have given all the reading. Yeah, so that is with the student, na? So they. Uh, that have, is that is with the student. They might would have gone through that. That's why I wanted to know from them whether okay. if if anybody have any kind of question related to that because this will be the interaction session on the grassroots innovation first, then the formulation part will uh, will be taken up. So, if any one of you have gone through that and have any query. They can ask because, uh, as far as the essentials and desirable readings were concerned, many of them were not having the uh, particularly the practices. So this is a natural question: What was the practices on which the formulation and how the formulation was made? So, if anyone have gone through that website, let me know if you have any query related to that. no let me start then so this was the first website here the author is talking about the formulations of a herbicides or particularly uh, for the scale insects in the guava plant why this paper is being cited because as many of all of we are aware that in agriculture to control the pest and diseases there are uh, various pesticides insecticides fungicides are being in the practices to use but everybody is aware that these pesticides fungicides are not the environment friendly or nature friendly because of several reasons if you say the history of pesticide development it has been started after the green revolution and very uh, much <clears throat> in the huge the market is very huge and uh, as far as the consumption is concerned uh, india's number is coming fourth or fifth in the pesticide consumptions but because of the large number of consumptions there were several problems related to that many of you would have been aware that in the in india in particularly in the states of punjab there is, there are uh, more cases of cancers why it is so in comparison with the rest of the states the region being cited is one of them is the uh, mass scale use of the pesticides in agriculture how it comes to the agriculture if uh, any of you is aware which was the first pesticides which was banned it was ddt because of this its bioavailability or its bio accumulation in the water system it has come to the food cycles or the food chain of the human system in this by the uh, same route it is coming to the human and some of them is also acting as a carcinogens and leading to the cancer development so as far as the problem is concerned not only the human but also the uh, soil is getting contaminated so the uh, 
and product, product, productivity, soil quality day by day is deteriorating because of this also. So there, uh, there was an uh, initiative how to get rid of that. And of course, uh, we are aware that as, as per the increasing in number of population, we have to feed the populations. And uh, as far as the uh, product, data production is concerned, if we want to use the pesticides or the fertilizers, of course, the yield will be lesser. But whether it is a myth or truth, many research which is related to, to particularly the organic products, uh, production or different uh, kinds of natural cultivation uh, processes, there are many organizations which, who are working on the sustainable agriculture and developing various agronomic practices to control the pests and pathogens by natural means. So strategies are there, but this is not in the practices, not in the implementations. At the same time, farmers also trying to evolve the practices because they are in, in the field, they are better scientists than us because, because they are connected with the nature. They are looking day by day problems and some of the solutions they themselves have developed or they are knowing that from the ages uh, or they have come to know that from their forefathers. So whether there is a uh, science in them or not, or from the, that, that practices, can we develop the formulation as effective as the product in the market? This is a question. And this is the reason why these Sadhbhav Sisti Natural Product Laboratory has came into the existence in the year, day back in the 2000. The objective was to bridge the gap between the informal knowledge and the formal knowledge. Why earlier I have asked you uh, <coughs> whether you have visited the websites for desirable or essential uh, uh, reading or not. The main, uh, prob uh, main problem was that if you would, ha would have been visited, you must have read the some of the practices. But Whatever the sites is mentioned in them, practices are very less. Particularly on the NIF website, they are not mentioning the practices because of the IP regions, because this is the intellectual property of that particular innovator. But there are practices which are in the public domain. And that you can see from the uh, website of Sisti. If you log on the Sisti website, you go to the database, and under the data, uh, database, you will see the honeybee published practices. Under that website, there is a search engine. Under that search engine, if you put any problem, whether it is any kind of pest, pest means whether it could be an insect or it could be a fungus. Say, for example, if it is an either aphid, jacid, white fly, these are the pests which is generally infecting the uh, crop populations or the different kinds of fungal or bacterial disease, if you write the name of any of that, you will, and then uh, click on the search, you will find a large number of practices related to that. And then you can read what are the practices, what is the innovator's method to prepare and how to apply that. There are uh, more than, uh, 8,000 such practices are available in the public domains. So if any of you is having interest to read the practices, you can log on to the SISTI website, go to database and honeybee search, uh, published practices, search that and read. Here in this paper, what they have done, they have used three plants. These are the plants which is being used for the development of a formulations to control the scale insect in the side of guava, guava, that is the amrut particularly. <clears throat> so these are the plants. Both the plants belongs to compositive family. You have purposefully put this picture because these are the wildly growing plants which they have selected. And they have selected this plant because they, they observed that ki these plants were not having the scales insect infection of the in scale insects and uh, uh, this uh, foliage of that that means the twig of these plants 
they have used for the production of vermi was here why they have used it is not mentioned in the paper but these plants we, is was not having the infections because the, these plants is going in the vicinity of the uh, guava orchard and they have selected this plant but, uh, used as a, a composting base for the uh, production of vermi was generally in vermi was no plant extract or plant waste is be, being used but they have purposefully used the west or the uh, of the, these two plants that they have put at the base in the drum the, the method is mentioned in, in detail in the paper and on the top they have used the cowdung for the composting and used the earthworm for uh, making the vermi pass these are the three ingredients they have used at the base in separate tank for the pro uh, production of vermi was normally vermi was is having the uh, composted extract of whatever the uh, composting agent we are putting. Generally, it is the leaf liters or with the, even without the leaf liters or generally the uh, we are putting the cordons for the decomposition. So whatever the, the, they have used the specific plant material to get the uh, wash of that and in different combinations, they have applied it on the scale insect. In another formulation, they have made the ash of these individual plants and then in different combination used. The author is claiming that the 10% of this combination is giving 90% control of scale insect in the guava. And this is dose dependent. That means if we are putting one gram, two gram, three grams, the efficacy is increasing, increasing exponentially. So that's why we have cited this paper, paper because the selection of the plant is somewhat similar to the innovators practices. Coming to the next paper, which is our paper from the lab, which we have published uh, in 2013, particularly, and it, the, the practice is being evaluated by uh, several agriculture universities and individual farmers also. The purpose of putting this is that, how we have selected the practices because this was to as you see the title the vegetable crops because this is one of the uh, major uh, <clears throat> annual crops uh, being grown in uh, several parts of the country and the problems of the vegetable paste are of different nature it could be a uh, uh, what is called the leaf curl kind of things or the stem borer or the infection in the root. So whatever the practices we have documented, particularly from the Gujarat, these are the, this is the map of the Gujarat and the uh, star which you are looking are the places from where we have documented the practices. So we have studied the almost all the vegetable practices and then tried to select the ingredients based on the available literature because once we want to develop any formulations we would like to know whether it is known for that in the prior art search that means in the, uh, we are doing the review of literatures and uh, in review of liter literature we try to find out that whether this plant is known for this particular paste or not if it is known then it is a, a common knowledge things but if it is not known then it is a unique things so one of the objective of doing prior art search, prior art search is to find the novelty of the practices so if the practices is novel whether we can file the patent on that because this is the uh, intellectual property of that particular innovator so we are filing the patent in their names and then trying to find out add the value scientific value to bridge the gap because suppose if x plant is giving control against the aphids or the jacids or the white fly so we are trying to protect the uh, in uh, the intellectual property right of that particular innovator and finding the patent in, the, in their names so likewise for this particular paper we have combined the uh, several practices done the permutation combination study and based on that that we have found, found some while this is also known in the literature say for example 
uh, many of you are aware with the neem. Neem oil is a well-known pesticides and uh, it is recommended that the 3% of the neem oil is giving very good result in almost all kinds of pests. Similarly, crunch oil or the castor oil is also giving the similar effect. So based on the common knowledge as well as the individual's uh, innovators practices, we have selected similar ingredients and develop a mixture of formulations and that we have studied in in vitro. In vitro means the, uh, we have first checked the efficacy in the under laboratory condition by reading the different pests, particularly the Heliothis and uh, Scolopter uh, Eleutera, and then also tried to evaluate its efficacy in the field condition at our Gram Bharti experimental field. And at the same time, we have given this formulation to different agriculture universities and the farmers to evaluate that. And no doubt the result was very good. And this is acting as a broad spectrum control for the vegetable pest. Then in the third, you would have seen the some aspects related to patent. Uh, if any of you would have gone to the write-up, then you can see the compositions. These, these were the composition of that particular patients. Of course, the methodology we are not mentioned in detail because we have, uh, while writing the patent, we are trying to give the permutation combination, but the efficacy, by judging the efficacy, we are finalizing the formulations. So the purpose of showing these articles is that there could be a number of ingredients being used by innovators, or you may decide yourself by reading the literatures. So the question is, if you want to select, how would you select? You need some model, to verify the efficacy, to check the efficacy. And then based on the re result, you can uh, just uh, prioritize the, uh, whether it is the number one, number two, number three. And then you can mix one plus one, one plus two, or one plus two plus three, one plus. So different permutation combination need to be met to find that whether the secondary ingredient is the increasing the effect of primary or it is only a co-component or it is decreasing the effect of primary. So to, to find out the co-component or to just define the co-component and their ratio, it is essential to study the various permutation combination. But in the farmer's practices, what you will see that they have taken this much gram of this, 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 and then added in water, boil that and reduce the volume by half. This is in, in the case in most of the practices because the water is the most common solvent solvent available to not only the grassroots farmer, but scientist also. And the another benefit of that is uh, most of the uh, those uh, water soluble compound will come into that. And these water soluble compounds are seldom harmful to the environment. Generally, those compounds which is difficult to soluble in waters are of complex nature and found toxic to several um, Pests or the other uh, any animals things, and the organism in which we are evaluating the toxicity. So the purpose of this uh, showing this uh, slide is to how we can decide the uh, permutation combination of different component while judging or while developing a formulation is important. So a large number of a study is required to validate which combination in which ratio is responsible to give or giving the result in which pest or pathogens. This is the another example. Here, this is a practice of Ganesh Datta, but you will not able to see the name of the ingredient. Normally, the ginger, chili, or the bitter plants, is having some property to control the place. He has developed a formulation. He has been awarded also by the NIF in the uh, National, National Award Function at Raspati Bhavan. 
and he has developed the formulation sold the formulation also in their own vicinity so as per his claim this formulation is giving control in almost all kind of pests that means mites termites white grubs so these are the very difficult problem in agriculture but as far as the bridging the gap that means elucidating the scientific principle of this control is yet to be done it is not elucidated the practice is validated it is showing good result almost 90% and the uh, it, it is showing the 25 ml per liter that means 2.5% of this formulation is giving very good result while the one uh, slide which i have earlier showed that 10% formulation of this uh, is showing the result so here in terms of the quantity being applied is quite similar to the available products in the markets particularly different sorts of pesticides but we don't know what are the compounds which is giving its results so it is a matter of research which can be taken up to elucidate the principles how why it is effective because if you see the problem of white grubs and the mites it is a very uh, uh, big problem and if this formulation is giving 90% result that is good enough so it can be propagated promulgated so nif have done its job they have given uh, they have awarded the innovators and trying to propagate uh, this formulation among the farmers by that farmer themselves that means in other way uh, the farmer is trying to be an entrepreneur that is good but the science scientific part is remain uh, unknown so the value addition is the most important in not only this kind of formulation but several other kinds of formulations here is the role of scientist student who can think is in different directions by making the smart validation plan so this is this uh, website of srishti once you visit the uh, lab website srishti website and database you will see the honey bee published practices here you can write the any problem and then put the search you will see the this kind of uh, published practices will come will come then you click on detail you will able to see the practices now i'm going to show you some of the practices for different different things so this was the practices from bihar here the plant used was pedidia fertilita and the thibetia that means nerium and this is being used to control the sucking pests in the crops water extracts of bantras this is the common name of pedidia and the kanir leaves and fruits for control of insect pests for the paddy now if any one of you is having the interest they can look the detail of this plant how this plant whether the science of this uh, insecticidal property of this plant is known or not if it is known whether the any formulation in the market is existing or not if it is existing what is the efficacy and how much is the uh, of this uh, compounds are in the use if it is not then it is a matter of product development similarly this is the practices to control the smut disease in the sorghum species here the plant used was the aristolochia bracteata it is commonly called kida mari that means the plant which is able to by the name it is being defined which is able to kill the insect and this is the another plant clerodendrons so the purpose of showing this two clerodendron uh, istolochia and clerodendron each controlling or effective against the smut disease now if any plant pathologist want to verify or elucidate whether it is the statement is correct or not then it is a question of validation if it is found correct then the question of value value addition to elucidate the compound to assign the compound for the control of smut disease it is yet not done and it is a matter of research 
Similar is the case with the other several uh, practices. So this is the herbal bud repellent. Here the word repellent means it is not the killing, not toxic, but removing, try, uh, removing the buds because of the unpleasantness in the eating by the bird. This is yet another formulation. Earlier was the uh, stem borer in different plants. This is in the mage. And here the uh, ingredient which was used is limonium acidisma along with the Ajayajakta indica. Similarly, in this practices to control the vegetable paste, Casuarina cutifolia is used. Here for the stem borer of paddy. Now you see, I have seen so on the three slides related to stem borers. Almost all is controlling the stem borer, but in different crops, different crops. It is very similar to the formulation which is in the market because if you see the uh, available pest, pesticides in the market for the wheat, there are different uh, pests for soybean, there are different pests. So the crop specifics. Innovators have also found the crop specific formulation or also developed the crop specific formulation for the same problem. So if, for example, stem borer. But here, if anyone want to try to do the research on the stem borers practices by the grassroot innovator, they can develop an atlas and make their own thesis, either the master thesis or PhD thesis. There are a number of experimental design can be made to elucidate the new compounds and to develop the new formulation and the products. Mm -hmm. This is to control the termite. So the purpose of sowing all these practices is to make you aware with the kinds of problems and the kinds of solutions and the ingredient being developed by the innovators, particularly the grassroots innovators. By validating the practices, we in the Sadhav Sistis and Soda Laboratory developed several products to control the sucking paste, chewing paste. Say for example, this is such responsible to control the sucking paste. And these are the name of the innovator from whose knowledge we have developed these formulations because as I told you earlier, we are filing the patent not in our name, but in the name of innovator because the, the, uh, it is they who have developed these practices. It is their intellectual property rights. So whatever the, if we are transferring this technology to some company, whatever the royalty will come, a part of that will also go to these innovators as per the agreed formula for the distribution of the royalty. Similarly, Sisti Priyas is responsible to control the drop of the flowers. So for different, different problems, we have pooled the practices, developed the, uh, evaluated the efficacy and developed the combination to make the formulations. So this is Rakchak. Then this is Kushak, particularly uh, for the uh, leaf curl. Then Prahar, Suraksha, these are all different because as you are aware that uh, the infecting pest at different stage of the growth of the crop varies at uh, early stage, at the uh, mid stage or the flowering stage, the nature of pest is different. So, and uh, some is sucking pest, chewing pest, that means leptopteran, dipteran and coleopteran. These are the, the uh, different class of the insects under which these pests belongs. So the efficacy of different extracts, again, the uh, different class of pests also varies. So depending upon that, we, are, we have classified the uh, different groups and then uh, selected the practices for that particular rules and developed the uh, evaluated the that means the validated the case 
and whatever the plant was found effective from that, by judging their combination, uh, we have developed formulations. And this is the flow chart, how we are doing the manufacturing from the grassroots practices. The, so the first step is the plant material procurement. Generally, uh, the purpose of putting this point is we are procuring the plants widely from the uh, resource area. That means from where we have documented the practices, not anyone uh, other, other places. And uh, trying to stick with the seasons also. Suppose if we have collected a plant in the summer season or winter season, the efficacy will, the, will be varied. So we are trying to procure the plant material in a particular seasons or particularly two seasons and then processed and trying to keep it and develop the formulation as per the need. Processing means cleaning and then the set drying. Did the QC for authenticity of the quality? As far as the quality is concerned, for any such formulations, there is no clear cut criteria mentioned in the regulatory norms. In the further slide, I will show you what are the regulatory norms under which we can get the license of such formulations. Then the extraction. These extraction is either solvent based extraction or the aqueous extractions. Then the storage of this extract and then formulation of the mixture of the extract at, at, in different ratio. At this stage also, we call the in-process uh, quality control where after mixing, we are doing the band analysis through TLC and HPTLC. Then bottling of this formulation, labeling, then secondary packing and dispatch for the cells or the So these are the products and this efficacy, particularly the QC, you may do the HPLC or HPTLC or TC. First, the, there are three aspects in the, in the quality control. One is the physical, chemical and biological. Physical means what is the texture, how it looks, whether it is the turbid or it is having some smells, what is the color, what is the viscosity, and then the flowability whether it is the uh, how the smells that, that it means organoleptic characters and then the whether this formulation is having any bacterial count because normally in the uh, formulations of the herbal formulation there are some endogenous organism which is natively found in the uh, that particular herbs and also comes in the formulations so we need to check that whether any microbes are there if it is there we need to control it otherwise there will be a problem they may lead to gas formations in the bottles and that will be not good for the formulation so if any such cases occurs we need to do the processing of that to get rid of that particular gasifications this is a slide which is showing the fingerprinting of the ingredients being used. The purpose is to show how to uh, develop the methodology for establishing the quality controls. Here, it is represented in different solvent, that is water, then the <clears throat> methanol, then chloroform, petroleum ethers. And these are the different compounds peak. This is the peak area, peak period, uh, depending upon that we can quantitate the, that particular peak and these are the different bands. So whatever formulations we have developed, they should they are, there should be some marker in the form of band where which we can uh, say that if it is at that particular RF, these three, four band is found, it should be present in almost all batches of formulations. So by doing the fingerprinting, we can establish the marker for the quality controls. That marker may not be identified also because 
we have not yet in many of the cases identified this bad is particularly for which compounds but this is uh, this can be done further i'm coming now to the some uh, pathogens these were the practices related to different sorts of pests so we do have the practices related uh, to different sorts of bacterial pathogens, fungal pathogens, and other pathogens. So we do have done the screening to find out the efficacy, and that is particularly against using different pathogenic organisms. And whatever the mark you are looking in the uh, colored one, they have sought the good results. The purpose of showing this slide is to just uh, because many of you would have been from the background of biotechnology. So what kind of biotechnology we can do for the development of pesticides or fungicides or insecticides. So to make you aware for that, from that point, we are discussing these things. So these are the different plants which we have evaluated for different, different pathogens. And many of them were having good results which can be developed to control that particular pathogens. So in the plate essay, if you will see, this is the Fusoria moxisporum, and this is the results of balanites fruits, because at the different portions of the fruit, that means epicarp, mesocarp, and dopap, is having the different compounds, and the efficacy is also different. Here, Stilago metis, uh, metis to, uh, this is your looking the halo regions, is showing the efficacy of the controls. Same against the different different pathogens. If you would read the literature related to the uh, pesticide or fungicide development, in 2015, the uh, Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of avermectin. Avermectin is a macrolide, in, uh, particularly the antibiotics. Similarly, uh, there was an insect uh, antibiotics which have been discovered in the year 1967. And this is uh, the name of that uh, antibiotic is milbemycin. Milbemycin is having very much similarity to the avermectins. Once the avermectin become resistant to different uh, different pathogens. The milbemycin has came into the picture for the development of different formulations because of its uh, macrolide structure sim similarity. But it is not it is showing the efficacy against the avermectin resistant pathogen in pests. It has been developed in the uh, formulation form to develop different fungicides in the crop. At the same time, a large number of research have been de developed to evaluate its efficacy in other insects and the pathogens. So it has been nowadays used as acaricides, insecticides, antihelminths, and also uh, being used against the nematodes, parasitic insects, and arthropods. Milbevacin have been used to control mites, liriomyja, these are all the pests, different, different pests in different, different uh, pro, uh, cr crops, including the fruit orchards. And this is being used in the 24 plant species, including apple, citrus, strawberry, and tea. And apart from the agriculture crops, particularly the fruit orchard is requiring also huge number of pesticides. So while developing the uh, new pesticides as per as the new norms of the government of India or the world for uh, designing the sustainable pesticides, our database is the large is having large number of resources to do the smart work to find similar molecules to the milbemycin, which can be effective against different resistance pathogen and pests. So 
Here, it is a different area of research in the biotechnology because uh, many of you are aware that apart from the plant, uh, many microorganisms is being used as a biocontrol agents. These biocontrols, the mechanism of action of these biocontrol is the diff uh, different. Some is having the hyperparasites or infecting the uh, pathogens. As far as the new development of new molecule is concerned, particularly we are aware that chitin is the outermost layer of most of the insects. And if we are able to degrade the outer layer of the chitin, the pest will be very much susceptible for different sorts of infections. So this chitinolytic bacteria associated genes and enzymes for plant protections are being studied, studied in various pests. Currently, the research is mainly focusing on finding novel strains of enzymes with potential application in pest management. Owing to the effectiveness and synergistic potential, the putative chitinase and chitinolytic bacteria are formulated as biocontrol agent for different applications utilized in the development of transgenics and supplemented with other pesticidal toxins. Many of you have heard about the name of BT cotton. BT cotton is a transgenic for to control the ball worms. But we have yet not developed any transgenic. Of course, the uh, Syngenta are in the pipeline to release such formulations for the uh, Chitin ages, but it is yet to come. Many of the other uh, scientific lab is working on that. So here the purpose of showing this slide is that we are aware that in almost all uh, house we are using for the pest control is having some endogenic microorganisms and these microorganisms role we are not yet sure how it is uh, helping in the control of the uh, different different tests so in the system we have developed a microbial bank for the from the isolation of soil samples from the, uh, different sodia sodia drugs similarly in one of the sodia drugs we have collected the that was the uh, Jharkhand Suryatra. We have collected the bark samples of the tree. And from that, we have isolated the endogenous organisms. Several of the endogenous organisms were having the catalytic activity and is able to control different sorts of pests. So the question is whether new organisms, which is having the uh, catenage activity, Substantial, particularly the substantial catenage activity can be formulated. But the, here, the problem in the formulation is that these are the uh, enzymes and all enzymes require certain physical condition to be active. At the room temperature, no enzyme will be active. So the formulation is the question marks. Many people are developing the encapsulation of chitinol. Many companies are in the pipeline to develop the um, encapsulation of the enzymes for the control of different different pests. So this is the biotech area where we can identify the new organisms having the highest catenage activity and catenage activity may or may not be a biocontrol agent, maybe a co-organisms, which is a <clears throat> saprophytic organism found in the either rhizosphere, but at the same time will be effective for the controlling different pests or the pathogen because of the, uh, the catenage activity. Because of this reason, many bacillus, bacillus and other organisms is being formulated and being tried as an effective mechanism for disease and pest control. Here the registration, whatever the formulation we are developing, if it is in chemicals, there is established norms, we call it CIB, that is Central Insecticide Board. They require different sorts of efficacy data and developing for the registration to give the licenses. But 
as far as these grassroots practice, practices is concerned, if we are developing the formulas, uh, formulations, they can also be licensed in the name of traditional formulation and practices. Rajasthan is the first state in India who are giving licenses, licenses for these such formulations. Similarly, many agricultural universities have developed the IPM, that is Integrated Pest Management Practices. So if the plant of the grassroots also within the IPM, it is very easy to put there under the IPM. If it is not, then we may uh, collaborate with the different agriculture university to put the, that particular plant in the list of the IPM by developing the by evaluating the efficacy of that plant. And the last one is the G2 licenses. G2 licenses recently uh, is the recent amendment where the, those kind of formulation which are having a stimulatory effect, almost all plant, is, have plant extract is having a stimulatory effect. So they have given the five, six such names, whether say, for example, protein hydrocyanide, then the humic acid, then seaweed extracts, the combination of that. So if the any of the ingredient or the formulation is having such component, they can also be likely licensed as bioestimulant besides the property of their uh, control of the pesticides. Because all these control of the pesticides is non-toxic. Why I'm telling the non-toxic means if it is toxic, this will be come under the CIV. CIV. If it is non-toxic, only then we can uh, get the G, uh, G2 license. Or as far as the <clears throat> recent trend of uh, new pesticide development is concerned, the criteria is that it should be environment friendly and uh, biodegradable. So whatever the formulations we have developed or the grassroots practices is telling about that is almost all 100% biodegradable. So they can be licensed under the G2 since they have, is also having the uh, stimulatory effect on the growth. And if they are not, they, then that can be licensed either traditional formulations or different sorts of required data can be generated for the CIV registration. But in the CIV, we need to give the not only the name of the plant but the name of the compound which is giving the effect that means very similar to the chemical pesticides now i will come to the another topic if anyone of you is having question on this uh, <clears throat> presentation let me ask Is there any question? Good morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah, tell me, please. The caterpillar, uh, sir, is there any solution to uh, control the caterpillars in mulberry plant there there are many herbal formulations for the caterpillar as i have told you you just log on the sisti website click on database go to the honeybee published practices put the name caterpillar at least 30 to 40 practices you will get read one by one and then uh, try whichever is feasible or uh, which kind, whichever the, the ingredient is very common in your area. You may try that. This is the related, I have given your answer in terms of grassroots practices. Now, if you wanted to know from the uh, market, uh, commercial point of view, there are so many formulations in the market available for that. But Caterpillar, is basically the uh, kind of pest which we call this chewing pest. They are the voracious e eaters. So whatever the formulation in the market for the chewing pest, that can be tried. 
have not given you the particular name purposefully so that you can look into the practices and then come to us. There are so many, not a single one. And the most common, I can tell you, just uh, you have uh, heard the name of Pabd Rice. It is a very uh, low cost or low cost practices. Farmer is just sprinkling the puffed rice in the morning in the orchard or the crop uh, in the farms. This is attracting the birds. Bird will come in the field and they, they will eat the caterpillar. This is the most eco-friendly practices. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, no one. Now I'm coming to another presentation on the uh, for human formulation. This is the practices <clears throat> related to uh, control. Normally, if there is a cut or wound, there will be the oozing of the bloods. So normally we are putting either the fit carry or the towels to stop that. But there are different formulations also and grassroot, one of the grassroot uh, community, particularly with Chunara community, that means those community which is doing the white washings. If they were having some any cuts, marks, and the blood is oozing out, they used to put the spider web over that to uh, just stop the oozing of the bloods. So this was the practices. Based on these practices, our objective was to find out the, because in the spider web, it is basically the uh, salivary glands oozes, which forms the thread of the uh, web and it is nothing but the protein. We are aware of that. So how to do the formulation from that? The question was that. What we did in the, uh, <clears throat> our natural lab product laboratory, we developed a cell line from the salivary gland of the spider. So this is the anatomical structures because there are various appendages in the body. You must be have been aware that it is an arthropods and the body is segmented. <coughs> the <coughs> head, thorax and the cephalothorax regions and then the six pair, eight pairs of this legs so these are the different appendages. This is the number. And this is the glands. So we have dissected that and isolated the ampullate, ampullate glands. And that gland we have first cultured in in vitro conditions. And from that, we have developed the cell line. These cell lines were further screened for the production of protein. And from that protein, we have formulated the agents to study the blood clotting study. These are the fine structures, we call the spirits and the spigots, how the uh, salivary gland is secreting the saliva for the thread formations. So for this particular thing, we have developed our own media. Normally the insect is, uh, we were not the first to uh, make the cell line of the insect. There are various, various literature, which is showing that on the insect media, you can develop the cell lines. So people have developed the cell line in the insect, particularly the from the salivary glands of Spirotera and Haliothis to do the co-culture of different uh, virus, NPV viruses to formulate that virus as a pest controlling agents. So we are not to, uh, first to develop the cell line of insect. It has all, there are several literature on that. So what we did, we did the first time the isolation of uh, this ampullate glands, the salivary glands of the spider is called the ampullate gland. And there are four or five ampulla. And that ampulla we have cultured. And then from that, 
ampulla, ampulla we have developed the suspension that suspension different dilution of that suspension we have cultured and find out a dilution which is giving either no cells or one cells so from that we have developed one colony the uh, descendants of single cells which has been developed into the cell lines this was the process how we have developed the cell lines and from that cell line we then further done the suspension culture and that suspension culture we have uh, done the isolation of uh, extraction of soluble proteins and that soluble proteins were formulated in saline the concentrations of that uh, soluble protein was 0.4 uh, microgram per ml and then that formulations was evaluated for the blood clotting so here are the cell lines things here is the culture and this was the concentration of soluble proteins and then in different we have keep the blood uh, uh, volume constant and increases the concentration of this formulation 0.1 microliter 0.1 ml 0.2 ml 0.3 ml and added in 1.5 ml blood 0.3 ml that is 300 microliters had given the instant result normal cl clotting time is 8 minutes so this is the proof that the uh, protein components from the cell line of ampullate gland is giving instant clotting at this concentrations. So this was the insight of this practices. Of course, we have not done that uh, further study to characterize the cell line. Cell line, the, so uh, that part is left, and then further bulk designing and to validate the claims then the clinical trial all are the lagging behind to evaluate the things if anyone of you would have the interest they may de develop the uh, cell line of this or can get the culture cell line from us but prior to that you need to find out what are the lab in india who is working on that while we have developed that it was it has been developed by by a student who was from the iit kharagpur at that time nobody in india was working on that but currently there are two groups which is working one is at the iit delhi another is at the cdfd hyderabad but they were working on the production of artificial yarn for that this protein is target our objective was different you may develop the cell line for the mass scale production and formulation development to do further validation and value addition in this lines so this is now open to you people to take it carry forward Is there any question on this? Have you any question on this? Uh, if you have any clarifications, you can ask Dr. Nirmal. He has given two topics, uh, talks on two topics. Any questions related can ask. I hope you all remember that day professor was talking about this uh, spider protein, right? Spider web protein. Yes. Yeah. So yes, can ask questions related to that also. Yes, sir. What are the insights? What are the insights you have got?
see those who are from the biotech background, they can took up the things from biotech point of view, those who are from the microbiology background, they can take from microbiology point of view, those who are, who are the botany background, they can take the things from botany background, those who are from the animal science or geology background, they can take up the things from their angles. So the, we are having different dis disciplines. The practice is related to almost all area of research from which you are belong. It is you who need to take the initiative from your angles and then we will guide accordingly. No doubts? You can also use the chat box to ask questions. I think no questions uh, from students' side. Though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Doctor. Okay, then shall I stop it? Ah, yes, Doctor. Okay, fine. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us. Uh, students, we may have one more uh, guest lecture with us today. Uh, we are expecting her shortly. Uh, please stay online.
Hello. Good morning, Doctor. Good, good morning. Uh, uh, students, uh, today we we have with us uh, Dr. Jodi Lakshmi Badasheri. Uh, she is a staff scientist at uh, National Institute of Plant Genomic Research, Hyper, uh, New Delhi. Uh, so basically, she works on the plant biotic and the uh, plant biotic interactions, especially uh, early si signaling on uh, insect herbivory, calcium signaling, and phytohormone signaling pathways. Uh, she received her PhD degree in plant molecular biology at Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, Germany, uh, followed by postdoctoral positions in Cornell University, USA, and Max Planck Institute for uh, Chemical Ecology, Jena, Germany. Uh, uh, she has uh, more than 30 research publications to her credit, and she has uh, guided a number of postdocs and uh, PhDs and master students. Uh, so let's uh, welcome Dr. Jyoti Lakshmi uh, to give her talk on uh, plant metabolics for crop improvement. Uh, doctor? Thank you very much. Here. Thank you very much for the introduction. So let me know if you see my slides. So can you see my slides in slideshow? Uh, yes, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Jyoti Lakshmi. I am working at the DBT Institute, National Institute of Plant Genome Research. And today I'll be giving you a talk on uh, use of metabolomics for crop improvement. How can we use this technology to produce, you know, climate resilient crops? So my lab works on plant insect interactions, which you can see in the pictures here. Uh, this is the insect that I work on, which is which is a generalist insect that you might have seen in your garden, or uh, it's called a Spodoptera litura. It eats many insect, it eats many plants, and it is a generalist insect. So we are trying to use this system uh, to uh, to you know generate transgenic or generate lines which can tolerate this uh, insect herbivory. And uh, before I go into per se into metabolomics, I'll just give a brief introduction of. Of what our system is, what is this plant insect interactions? Yeah, because I'm sure there are not many labs in India working on plant insect interactions at the molecular level. And uh, just to give you a glimpse of why we are studying it. So insect attacks cause a lot of crop loss like biotic, like a drought, abiotic stress, like drought or flooding uh, and uh, microbes. There is uh, similarly insect attack causes more than 25 percentage crop loss. And there are different kinds of insect uh, species which attacks plants. Mm, essentially, they attack all parts of the plant. You can see the example of, for example, a leaf chewing larvae. They are eating all the parts of the leaf. There are some insects like aphids, which per se do not, you, when you look outside, there is no uh, damage, but they suck the phloem sap or they suck nutrients from inside the uh, plant. There are some cases, mesophyll grazing, leaf miners, uh, there are mites, for example, all of this in plant or upper parts of the plant. There are also insects which feed on the roots of the plant or root borers, which cause enormous crop loss. And as you have, would have seen, uh, many fruit borers as well. So insects that bore into the fruit. So essentially all parts of the plant are attacked by insects and hence it's important to study them. What are the mechanisms? What are the genes that we can manipulate to improve resistance against insect herbivory? Now, when I talk about plant insect interaction, not all plant and insect interaction are bad for humans. Yeah, what, what we are talking about or the conflict is when plants are food for certain insects. For example, you can see this larvae has bit, bitten this tomato plant. Yeah, so this is a conflict uh, which is bad for the plant. But not all of these interactions are bad. There are some examples where they are alliance. For example, there are some predatory or parasitic arthropods which protect plants from herbivore damage. For example, this is an insect which is attacking the plant and there are some predators which are also insect, which lays egg on this, uh, in, on this specific uh, larvae and kills it. 
so this is an alliance or it helps the plant sometimes other cases of help you might also know pollination for example is done by many butterflies and this this is a example of alliance so uh, where they they work together but since we are talking about crop production we are mainly focused on the conflict which arises between plants and insects and this is the model system that in our lab we are studying we cannot study too many insects because uh, you know you have to rear the whole life cycle of this insect in the lab to do any experiments okay so we study the common cutworms podoptera litura uh, which is a common pest of many vegetable crops and many other crops and also uh, uh, related species called podoptera frugiperda which is a fall armyworm i don't know if you have heard this fall armyworm is an insect which comes as a army into a field uh, you know into a field of uh, maize or rice and eats up the entire uh, plants very quickly in the case of maize it is a huge problem in india and all over the world now because they are uh, boring into the eating the leaves first they are boring inside uh, onto the tissue of the maize and causing lot of damage so these spodoptera are voracious and very fast feeders they feed on the aerial parts that you see and they have a very wide host range they can attack many plants so uh, if they can attack many plants how do the plants um, resist this insect what are their in strategies to resist it when you talk about plant and insect interaction there are two things that the plant is able to sense you can see the picture of two caterpillar cartoon of them so first the plant senses wounding you know it 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 realizes that it has been wounded second it senses the uh, you can see it spitting on the plant right so it senses certain chemicals or elicitors in the spit of the larvae uh, and uh, activates its defense system so it senses both wounds and elicitors in the oral secretion so when the plant senses it it knows now i have to activate my defense or i have to activate all those weapons which will help me fight the insect now what are those weapons that we know that helps plants to fight against insects one is this plant hormone pathway in the case of chewing insect it is this hormone pathway called jasmonate signaling i will come to it in detail in the next slide the next arsenal after this jasmonate upregulation you will see an upregulation of secondary metabolites okay these are called the chemical defense arsenal of the plants so they activate secondary metabolites like glucosinolate benzocinoid many examples and defensive proteins now what does the secondary metabolites do in the plant the secondary metabolites in most cases makes the plant less tastier to the insect to put it very simply yeah and they get converted into toxic uh, material uh, or toxic chemicals which is not good for the growth of the larvae so that is what essentially secondary metabolites do now these are called direct defense that is the plant induces them when the insect is feeding on them there is another mechanism called an indirect defense wherein it sends out metabolites into the air so these are called volatile compounds which are released into the air and which uh, you know which are being sensed by another set of insects which are called predators or parasitoids and they come and feed on this insect so it's a kind of it is calling a friend to you know attack an enemy so this is an indirect defense strategy but it also involves the use of metabolites yeah so in plant insect interaction metabolites are involved in multiple steps of the pathway jasmonates the secondary metabolites the indirect defense so it's critical for us to be able to measure metabolites in such a system we'll start with the first one which is plant hormones or phytohormones like in human body you have hormones like that plants also have what is called as phytohormones they regulate multiple stages of life cycle so for example they regulate germination growth flower development they regulate how plants respond to biotic stress they regulate sometimes fruit ripening so regulate all stages of plant life cycle and also help plants to cope up with stress 
throughout their life so these are small molecules which are present in very small you know very mind, less concentration in plants and they can be transferred from one part of the plant to another and helps plant in multiple processes now what are the example of plant hormones in general so uh, in general there are four major plant hormones or three of them majorly that we use when we talk about plant biotic interaction one is jasmonic acid another is salicylic acid and one is abscisic acid now jasmonic acid also has a bioactive component called jasmonic acid isoleucine and it is produced by the precursor cisopedia so why i am showing you chemical structures when you study biology it is very rare that you imagine that chemistry is intertwined in the whole process yeah we are talking about chemicals produced by the plant and we are trying to discuss how do we you know how do we detect them or measure them in plants so it's essential to know their structure because if you come to the next slide you will realize it's based on the structure that we quantify them at some point yeah at this with this slide you only have to understand that there are phytohormones which are present inside the plants which help it to overcome various uh, you know stresses now what are those stresses which a phytohormone helps plants to overcome for example as i told you in biotic stress it is jasmonic acid and salicylic acid which is the key when you talk about drought stress one of the markers or one of the key hormones activated is abscisic acid or aba the third one is during cell differentiation or growth hormones uh, which are activated as cytokinin uh, and for stem elongation germination dormancy flowering gibberellins are responsible and for coordinating many growth processes auxins are responsible so we call all these down three hormones which are involved in growth which is cytokinin gibberellin and auxin as growth hormones and jasmonic acid salicylic acid and abscisic acid as defense hormones so these are critical of, for plant response to any stresses now we'll come back to plant insect interaction we know that there are hormones and out of this hormones which is important for defending plants against herbivore insects so 90 percentage of all defenses against insect herbivore is via this jasmonic acid pathway or jasmonic acid signaling the salicylate are more involved in plant microbe interactions okay now as i told you jasmonic acid uh, uh, or the metabolite or small molecule or hormone is uh, there are three kinds of it which we are interested in analyzing one is the jasmonic acid per se this is a bioactive form of jasmonic acid which where it is conjugated to an amino acid see the structure in red is the same as ga now it is conjugated and with an isoleucine which is an amino acid and it is this ga isoleucine which is sensed actually by the plant there is also the precursor or what forms ja is this precursor called opda now all three are it is important to quantify all three in every process now the question is if there are all these three forms how are they how does the plant know that okay now this ja ja isoleucine is there how do i activate a defense pathway yeah so how is it perceived in plants so in plant biology like we use in biomedical field we have model plants which we use like you have heard you use mouse model for biomedical research like that we use arabidopsis thaliana which is a weed actually but it has a very short life cycle so we use it as a model plant in um, plant biology for discoveries on pathways and in arabidopsis this is how ja is perceived by cells so ja gets converted to the bioactive form ja isoleucine it goes inside the nucleus it is perceived by this special protein called coi1 which is its receptor and which uh, you know uh, removes the degradation by its repressor jas and activates the mic2 transcription factors which in turn lead to the upregulation of ja responsive genes and which leads to plant defense pathway now it is not good for the plant if it always keeps on producing this you know this uh, uh, bioactive form of jasmonic acid isoleucine because it's not good for its growth to always have it so the plants also have a mechanism to to uh, attenuate or to stop this production 
you, you, by converting this JA LA into an OH form, which is an inactive form. They have, you look at the structure, they have just added an OH here, hydroxylated it, and it became inactive. So it no longer will activate this pathway. In this way, plant is able to regulate growth and defense. Anyhow, important take home message here is that there are plant hormones which are sensed by proteins inside the plant and which activates plant defense. Yeah, so this is what when there is a wound or herbivore, the jasmonic acid is produced in the cytosol of the plant cell. It gets converted into this bioactive form, JA isoleucine. Uh, uh, in the normal form, when there is no JA isoleucine or when your plants are without any stress, there is no need to activate any JA responsive genes. So this MIC is under the control of this JAS proteins and all these genes are repressed. Now when JA isoleucine is formed upon herbivory or wounding, the JAS repressor is uh, you know, targeted by the koi and there is a 26S proteasome degradation of this complex and the MIC2 is free to express the JA marker gene and your defense is activated. Okay, so what happens if you... Uh, mutate this gene. So this koi, as I told you, is a receptor of this, this ligand, which is the JA isoleucine. What will happen if you do not have it? Okay, so this is the experiment which proves that this is a wild type Arabidopsis plant, which is our model organism. This is a plant in which I have mutated that the, a gene called koi1, which is the receptor of JA isoleucine. You see what happens if that gene is not there, the plant is completely fed by the insect. So not having the gene leads to in, uh, increased feeding, increased larval weight gain, which tells us that this pathway is crucial for plants to defend against herbivory. Okay. Now, this is not the original title of our talk. The title of the talk is, if jasmonic acid is important for this process, if you are given a plant where you have to, you know, measure all these metabolites, how would you do it in a, in a practical setup? Yeah. So how do you measure in general metabolites in any system if you want to improve anything? So there are two main uh, methods that I would use to measure metabolites. One is a gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Another is a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So GCMS and LCMS. These are two major methods that I will use to quantify these metabolites. Now, what is mass spectrometry? Just in very simple terms. It's a technique used for measuring and analyzing molecules that involves introducing high energy yeah, that into the target molecule to cause its ionization and disintegration. You think about jasmonic acid structure. I am bombarding it with high energy uh, material and making it to break up. Okay, This resulting primary ions and their fragments are analyzed based on their mass to charge ratio to produce a molecular fingerprint. So they are fragmented and they will fragment in a particular manner, which is very specific for each molecule. And this, this you know, um, this we will use to quantify it. Okay. So what is important here is this word mass to charge ratio. Now what is mass to, okay, before I come to mass to charge ratio, I'll tell you what are the components of a mass spectrometer. I don't know how many of you have seen the equipment and whether they are available in your colleges. Um, but So there are three parts of a mass spectrometer. One is an ionization source or an ion source. There is a mass analyzer which is used for separating the masses and then you have a detector for ion detection. Now, there, depending on the kind of equipment, let me just uh, finish off this. Uh, cartoon, yeah. Depending on the type of the analyzer, you have an electro, electron ionization, you can go for chemical ionization, depends on what metabolite you are dealing with. Sometimes MALD, uh, uh, in for ion separation, you can have a quadruple, you can have a time of flight or an ion trap, depends on which equipments you can have, you can analyze specific metabolites and there are also specific detectors for here. Now, based on all of it and fragmentation, as I told you, each metabolite will have its own fingerprint. And this fingerprint is based on what is called as mass to charge ratio or M over Z or M over Z values. Okay, This is based on the principle that ions or metabolites um, uh, are separated 
on the basis of this mass to charge ratio. In very simple terms, look at this picture. Imagine this is my metabolite of interest. This is the chemical structure of it. Now I put it in mass spectra. I make a sample prep, uh, inject it into a mass spec. The machine has high energy, uses high energy to fragment it. What is fragment? Breaking it. Okay, now see. There is an ion which is detected, CH3, it can detect, it sometimes can break only this part. You see OCH3, it detects at M over Z value 43. There can also be an ion peak, which is the same thing, uh, which comes up at M over Z value uh, 58. So like that, I fragment this molecule multiple times and I select one peak, which is my base peak, which always, this is non, a kind of non-fragmented thing. Now the biggest fragment or the most abundant fragment here is this, what I call as a base peak. And I use this, it's retention time for the uh, quantification of a metabolite. Okay. I'll show you an example in hormones, how we do it. Now, based on this principle, I want to analyze now in a given plant, plant hormones. Okay. So, it's important to understand what, when you talk about mass spectrometry, you'll always have to think, what is your target molecule? As in chemically, what is it? Most of the plant hormones are organic acids. Yeah. So, organic acids per se can be also analyzed by GCMS, which is gas chromatography. However, in gas chromatography, the sample preparation is very tedious. You have to convert it into methyl esters or you have to derivatize it uh, to make it, uh, you know, to fly in the GCMS. So the steps for its extraction, purification and derivatization are very tedious in GCMS. So we develop method where we can quantify plant hormones in an easier way using LCMS. Okay, I will come to it how we do it. But when we do it, we are able to quantify multiple plant hormones in different plant species. You can see the hormone levels are quite different in different plants. See, Medicago, for example, has high level of SA uh, at some point. In, uh, and, uh, you know, the levels of JA in, in comparison are less. We can hardly detect JA isoleucine. So each species has its own phytohormone profile. Now, how do I measure these phytohormones on an LCMS? As I told you, I don't want to measure on GC because it's very tough to produce, to do the sample preparation. You have to derivatize it. And uh, it is not a high throughput method. What is high throughput? I can't measure many samples at one time on GC. So I decided I'll go on LCMS. So uh, the equipment that I use is a triple quadruple mass spec. And it has a very high sensitivity. I can analyze in a raw extract. What is raw extract? not grinding leaf in water. Okay, low, low extract is I will grind a defined quantity of leaf sample in methanol. I will extract it in methanol solvents, which helps it, it in better extraction. There can be metabolites which cannot be extracted in methanol. So you will have to work out for your metabolite of interest, which is the solvent which works best for its detection. Okay, so it, we can analyze it in raw extract, high selectivity, and it has a short analysis time or high throughput. So that's why we uh, use this for our phytohormone estimation. Now, how do you quantify it, however? So we use this isotopically labeled or deuterated internal standard for quantifying this plant hormones. I'll just come to how we do it. So we, we want to develop a method where I quantify SA, ABA, JA, JA, isoleucine, OPDA, everything in one, one go. I don't want to run one, one reaction to quantify everything. So what do I do? I, I look at the retention time of each of these uh, hormones. As you can see, they all, you look at this peak at coming at 5.7. Yeah, they all are eluting at different, different times. And I use labeled internal standard, which is different from this, uh, uh, essay that you detect in your plant. Okay, so it's M over Z or its retention time is a little bit different. So I can look at this um, peak which is coming in my sample. I can I know the peak which will come at a certain time in my internal standard, which is different from the sample. And I know how much concentration of internal standard I used. So based on that, using a simple N1V1 calculation, you can quantify in absolute quantification of your plant hormones and you can run all of these hormones together in a single sample run of 15 minutes. You see none of the peaks will overlap.
if you uh, if there are any doubts you can write it down and ask me in the end okay so in this way i am able to quantify these plant hormones uh, for uh, for my work now um, if there are so many plant hormones and uh, you know which can defend plant why is it that still the insect is eating on so many plants so how does the in insect overcome all these uh, jasmonid uh, pathway so the insects are also very clever they co evolve with the plant as the plant produces a metabolite the insect will figure out a way to detoxify it to or to you know do something that it is no more toxic for example this is an example of a hormone cisopda it it is uh, when the plant when the insect eats this plant with high level of opda in in the insect gut yeah there are certain enzymes gst enzyme which convert this cis opda into iso form what is cis and iso they are just you know uh, different uh, stereo forms of it essentially the structure is the same it's just the double bond position is different but this conversion uh, makes uh, detoxifies it and it no longer can produce jasmonic acid yeah so this is one way how insects are uh, you know detoxify it how do you do use metabolomics to know whether insect has done it you know you you will analyze um, the insect fras you know you, what comes out of the insect the fras and you will look for those metabolites how they are detoxified uh, using metabolomics as well so you can use it for your plant study you can also use it to know what happens to these metabolites in the different organism as well now after phytohormones if you remember that first slide one of the uh, the most essential secondary metabolites which help plants in uh, defending against uh, various biotic stresses are available and there are different kinds of it so after photosynthesis you have carbohydrate metabolism nitrogen fatty acid metabolism that is the primary metabolism and out of them are derived you know the secondary metabolites for example tannins cumarins quinones flavonoids polyketides terpenoids alkanoids many of them so they are phenolics they can be nitrogen containing compounds they can be terpenoids now you can ask me this question why do they have so many metabolites in plants so the reason why plants have so many secondary metabolites is plants have plants cannot move they have to stay in one place and defend against so many insects so many pests you know so many biotic stress you can run away right if somebody uh, shoots you you can run away but a plant has to stand there and uh, you know live there so he he uses this chemical arsenal to protect himself yeah now there are diverse secondary metabolites in plants for example we'll start with this big tree which is a poplar Uh, the major metabolite there is salicylates which help it in countering uh, various biotic stress visia faba has lot of lectins terabidopsis this is a model plant i'm talking about it has high amount of secondary metabolites glucosinolate and tamelexin coco uh, has tropan alkaloids mace has terpenes and benzocinoids plantago has these special metabolites spruce has terpenes and phenolics so different plants have different kind of metabolites that it uses to defend itself so again you can ask me the same question like you asked me with jasmonids how will the insect how, how still the insects are able to eat all these plants right even if there are so many metabolites somehow insects have come up with ways to overcome these plant metabolites so these metabolites are toxin for the insect they cause health problems they can be uh, they overcome it by sequestering it into special organelles or rapidly excreting it or degrading it as you saw with the example of uh, isopda so this is how they overcome it in many cases in many cases they can't overcome and hence they are killed by uh, you know by the plant so i'll i'll not go into details i'll just give you an example of how we uh, two plant species and two metabolites and how plants overcome these plant secondary metabolites the first example is in a brassica species uh, uh, which is your cabbage cauliflower family it is the same family in which my model plant arabidopsis is also there so they produce this metabolite called glucosinolate which is an amino acid uh, derived secondary metabolite and the breakdown product of it is toxic to insect so how is it that it is toxic so this is the glucosinolates 
so per se they shouldn't be toxic to the plants okay which produces it then uh, which produces it shouldn't die so you know they they are stored in special organelles and when when a plant is bitten by an insect there are certain enzymes inside the plant which uh, which are you know which are activated or mixed up with this glucosinolate only on wounding which are called myrosinases now glucosinolate myrosinases combine together and it breaks down the glucosinolate and you get many toxic and distasteful breakdown products which are bad for the insect okay so this is how its toxicity is happening so if you look at structure now when i told you metabolomic structure you should be you should it's a multidisciplinary field and you should be able to think about structure of everything so this is the glucosinolate you are having the plant enzyme myrosinases and it uh, it is converted inside the uh, you know it gets break down and produces this isothiocyanate which is very toxic for insect and the release of toxic isothiocyanate from glucosinolate is often referred as the mustard oil bomb so it's like a bomb the glucosinolate are inside the plant when the insect feed on it the myrosinases you know take out the fuse of that bomb and you will get this isothiocyanate and the insect is dead yeah so this is called a two, two component plant defense now insects are very clever uh, you okay uh, how do you analyze this or how will you quantify these glucosinolates essentially glucosinolates can be quantified very easily by hplc yeah you don't need to take it to the mass spec uh, per se so you can quantify it very easily using hplc so how insects counteract glucosinolate so this is the glucosinolate somehow insects have to overcome them so they are very clever they use this they use this sugar it uh, which is present in their diet and add it to that glucosinolate sometimes that is glycosylating the glucosinolate now it became a bigger metabolite and it no longer can function uh, can be converted into this isothiocyanate so glucosylation uh, is uh, responsible one step of uh, you know detoxification other is they'll remove this uh, desulfonation they remove the sulfate and then it can again not be converted into isothiocyanate the other is nitrile formation in pyrus rapi yeah so different steps by which it will not um, uh, go into becoming the isothiocyanate now who can counteract it can all insects detoxify secondary metabolites the answer is no not all insects can detoxify secondary metabolites only the specialist insect that is those insects which only feed on brassica how will it feed there are certain insects which only will feed on uh, brassica plants if there are so many glucosinolates how will they live on that plant so they have come up with mechanism wherein they have you see look at the glucosinolate profile they have converted all the glucosinolate into desulfoglucosinolate they have detoxified it by removing the sulfur the pyrus rapi has converted all the glucosinolate into nitrile and it can no longer form the isothiocyanate and so these are specialists which can uh, counteract the metabolites and okay and the generalist you see all more mostly black black lines what is this black it is this isothiocyanate it's not able to convert this glucosinolate or detoxify it so they are mostly dead by the glucosinolate secondary metabolites okay so they counteract secondary metabolites also based on their feeding behavior they would have come up with strategies if they are specialists to detoxify it is this the only way that they you know overcome it the answer is no so here uh, this group of researchers uh, have uh, used maldi imaging to find where are these glucosinolate accumulated in the plant so this is a leaf where the insect was feeding okay it has bitten all these parts now they imaged the uh, you know the glucosinolate in a whole plant and whatever is red here this there are there is increased glucosinolate in these parts of the plant and now what do you see when you think about it with respect to insect feeding what do you see see the insects have avoided all those parts where there is lot of the secondary metabolite they have went and fed at parts where there are not much meta secondary metabolite so they can also avoid this tissue where the glucosinolate for example are are located okay 
this is one example. So here we have learned that glucosinolates is a secondary metabolites which are quantified by HPLC. It can be in brassica species. This is the marker for plant, uh, you know, plant defense against herbivory. And there are various, however, specialist insects can detoxify many of them. Now let's go to another crop. This is an example of maize and fall armyworm, which is the, okay, still people entering. <laughs> Uh, this is an example of maize and fall armyworm, uh, which is, uh, as I told you, Frugipoda, Spodoptera frugipoda. It's one of the most important maize pests. The, na the name armyworm, as I told you, refers to a sudden massive occurrence of pest insect that, uh, which attack crop fields like an entire army once their food source is exhausted. Huge crop loss. And uh, we are targeting this major met metabolite pathway, benzocinoid, in this crop plant. Okay. So this is a collaborative project with ICAR, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, with the Indian Institute of Maize Research, which is in Ljubljana. India had a big attack of this fall armyworm in 2019, and maize was devastated in India. We never had any germplasm or any crops which are sources of resistance against this insect herbivore. So this huge ICR project started with IAMR, NIPGR, multiple institutions in India, where we were screening for maize germplasm. Uh, uh, which is resistant to this fall armyworm. So this is a plot where the maize are grown. Then you put with this paintbrush, you put insect onto the, um, onto the maize plant and uh, you score how much the insect has eaten on the plant. And you give it a scoring. If insect has eaten, you know, a plant completely, it will get, a, uh, you know, higher scoring force. That is susceptible. If it has eaten less, it will get a, a lesser scoring, a scoring of two or one. They are resistant. So based on such scoring, uh, the IMR has come up with two promising uh, plant varieties in which the insect is not able to eat much. Okay, Now came my task. My, my part was I have to identify why is it that this, these genotypes are resistant and why some are susceptible. Okay, So we, for our study, we use three genotypes, the BML6, which is highly susceptible. You know, you put it a fall armyworm on it, it will eat up almost uh, uh, a lot. You can see here also with the larval weight, if you put a lot of larvae here, the insect is gaining a lot of weight. Okay. Now, these are the two resistant cultivars which we have, CML71 and DMRE63. And on it, they are resistant cultivars because the insect is not able to grow on these two cultivars. Okay. So our task is why? Why is it that this is happening? What is the metabolomic basis of this resistance and susceptibility? Okay. Now, in maize, as in other crops, plant hormones, as I told you, or jasmonates are the key markers of plant defense. So what we did, we took the susceptible variety, we took the two resistant varieties, using metabolomics, quantified all the plant hormones. This is before wounding, this is after wounding. This color, red color indicates increased levels. So what do you see? Without me telling you, you can see that in DMRE63 with this resistant line, there is a high induction of all the level, all the jasmonates. So we are quantifying various jasmonate isoforms. All of them are highly induced in this resistant variety. Okay. So this is the R, R DMRE63. High constitutive, not only when insect is there, even without insect also it has high level of certain hormones, and it is also induced. Now look at the susceptible variety in which the insect is eating a lot. It's all blue only you know, in both the places. So there is no induction. There is absolutely no induction of jasmonates on herbivory in these lines. The other resistant line, CML71, also has a moderate induction of jasmonates. So jasmonates have been used as a marker here, or we are using it as a metabolomic marker to understand the basis of resistance and susceptibility in this case. Is jasmonate the only thing that we can look? Uh, no. Okay, I'll also come to the rest one. We also quantified the level of phytohormone. This, the earlier slide I showed you is only 24 hour of feeding. Now, 24 hour is a very late time point for a hormone induction. So we looked up at a different time point, 3, 6, 24, all of them. Now, look at the level of JA and JA isoleucine. This is your susceptible genotype, BML6. There is absolutely no induction of jasmonates, very less. 
Now in your resistant variety, CML 71, yes, the JA and the JLA levels do increase, but they are a little delayed induction. See, at three hours, nothing happened. Six hours, they started increasing. Whereas in DMRE 63, which is a highly resistant variety, the JA and JA levels show a rapid increase upon fall army worm feeding. Okay. So this is how we measure the basis of this resistance. Now, uh, okay, I'll skip this. So uh, uh, as I told you, phytohormones are not the only, only metabolites or small molecules that we are looking in maize. But in maize, the major defense metabolite against chewing insect is the special class of metabolites called benzacinoid. You might have heard the name Dimboa. So Dimboa is a class of benzacinoid. Okay. And like glucosinolate, where Dimboa, you know, is stored in a certain form when insect eat, it becomes something else. So this is the same pathway for benzacinoid. So the maize is producing it this, to this complex pathway involving multiple genes. However, this benzocinoid are stored in the plant in a separate vac compartment vacuole as glucosylated forms. So these are combined with sugars and st uh, show st you know stored as stable glucoside. When an insect eats, when or when there is a mechanical damage, uh, there is this beta glucosidases, which are enzymes which cleave this sugar out. And you get what is called as a toxic egg glucone. That is the sugar thing is gone. Now these toxic things are formed, which are toxic to the insect, insects per se. But the plant will not produce these toxic things and keep. It will only produce it when the you know when there is a damage. So in this way, the plant is also protecting itself and not uh, you know wasting its resources. Now I want to be able to um, devise a method where I can quantify all of this. I want to quantify what is in maize plants, stable metabolites, these toxic egg glucons. I want to quantify it. Okay. Before that, uh, it's also important to understand that the fall army worm is a very, very clever insect. It can also detoxify many of these benzocinoids like dimboa by glycosylation. Yeah. How, what it does is imagine this is the structure of dimboa gluc, which is in the plant. Uh, you, you know, so here you can see the special structure, the uh, it is at a special position to our position. Yeah. And it, it, it is acti acted by plant glucoside and converts to dimboa, which is toxic to insect. Now, what does the insect do at many cases? It changes the position of this gluc it's from 2R to 2S. It, it just attaches the glucose at a, you know, separate position. Now, then no longer this plant glucosidase can act on it and you can no longer get a dimboa. So it, it can still detoxify dimboa, but at two varying levels. But there are many other metabolites which it cannot detoxify yeah, in this pathway. So with sugar, detoxification of glycosylation is an important detoxification pathway that stabilizes toxins and uh, it can, you know, uh, detoxify many metabolites. Now the question comes, how do I quantify it? In, on LCMS. So this is a method that we develop in our in, institute. It is based on what is called an MRM-based quantification because there are so many metabolites that now that I have to quantify together. Okay. So I know I'll take, I know that this stable metabolite, if I take the standard of it, if I fragment it, this is the peak that I should take as my base peak. That is my most abundant peak. And this is the retention time that it will come. So now based on this information, I tried to develop a method where I put all the MRMs of all the Dimboa um, conjugates and try to develop a method where in a single run of 30 minutes, I will, uh, you know, be able to quantify it. Now, um, we, we were able to develop such a method and we quantified the level of benzocinoid in, again, the resistant variety and the, and the susceptible variety and the two resistant variety. This is control plants. This is after 24 hours of the fall army worm uh, feeding. Okay. So you can see here, I don't need to tell you here, you can see that in control condition also in this line, the level of benzocinoid is very high. Uh, and upon feeding, it is increased more in both the lines, in both the resistant lines. Look at the susceptible line, it's still blue. So very low, low level of benzocinoid. And that is why this plant is not able to defend against this fall army worm. So we are using this metabolomics as a strategy to uh, score for resistance and susceptibility. Okay, I hope this is clear to you. So benzocinoid and jasmonates are excellent markers for resistant screening in plants. 
uh, especially for maize resistance to fall army bomb. We have developed methods using metabolomics to quantify it and in this way confirm the basis of host plant resistance in this tool line. And we can use it for screening hundreds of uh, germplasm lines. Okay. And uh, the next task is to identify the genes in this pathway, which we can manipulate. Why are we doing all this? We are Because we want to utilize this host plant resistance as a strategy for integrated pest management to control this insect. Okay. Now, how are we doing all of this? So all the studies that I have mentioned here, we have a very excellent metabolomics facility at NIPGR where we have multiple mass spectrometers, HPLC, LCMS, GCMS, ICPMS, HPTLC. So all the uh, hormones and benzocinoid are quantified by LCMS. The primary metabolites like amino acids, sugars are quantified by GCMS. ICPMS is used for um, elemental uh, or ionome profiling in plants, oil, anything, HPTLC for flavonoids. We have standardized multiple methods. It, this is... Uh, this can be used by any of you for your studies. This is a facility pay and use facility. And you can look up at our web page uh, for more details. But we have used this modern technologies in crop improvement. I hope you got it that we have used it for screening resistant susceptible variety for studying a system. Here I have told you a system of plant insect interaction. You can use it for screening for drought resistance. Okay, You can screen for multiple other things using metabolomics. With this, I want to end my talk. This is my uh, group in uh, at NIPGR. It's uh, located in Delhi, in South Delhi. So we have a huge group which works on major, uh, many aspects of plant insect interaction, not only metabolomics. We uh, do a lot of basic biology work. We uh, work on ion channels also in plants. So we collaborate extensively with uh, NCBS, with the uh, Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, ENA, ICGB, IMR in Ludhiana. And we are funded by Department of Biotechnology, ICR, the Max Planck Society, and EMPO. And I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the session yeah. is open for discussion now. Uh, if you have any questions or clarifications, you can ask Dr. Jodhilakshma. Yeah. You can ask anything. I mean, don't be scared to ask. Um, it can be, you know, trivial question. You can still. So I can ask you, anybody has used any metabolomic tools for their research? Any, what are you guys using for, um, you know, for quantifying any metabolite? Any of you can. I think, uh... These students are undergraduates level. Okay, okay. But okay. they are in this at the end of the workshop, they are going to develop a small project proposal. Okay. Uh, which uh, Bayrak will grant them one lakh for each proposal. Oh, very nice. Award to okay. conduct the research. Okay. So that we are we are giving like a exposure to different aspects. Okay, very nice. So very that nice. they will gain a knowledge to it be easy for making their proposals yeah. idea. Okay, you can, if you're looking on plant biology, for example, you can use this uh, hormones as a marker to select for plants which have tolerant to various things. For example, if you're studying drought stress, you can use ABA as a marker and look for measure ABA levels in different plants. So this can be one small project, just my ideas that you can use. Yeah? But feel free, free to contact me if you have queries and um, also Any queries? email. Students? I think online it's very difficult it's for very them difficult. <laughs> to yes. have concentration. Anyhow, yeah. I'm sure at least somebody has understood something. Okay. Uh, you can uh, share your PPT with us, uh, doctor. So I will pass it to the students. And also your, I will give them your email ID in case they are having any questions, they can contact you. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's all for today's students. Uh, if you have any qu questions need to ask for today's session, you can write to us. We will get back. Uh, we will uh, try to get answers for your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.